This summer, we are going through the book of Proverbs. And by going through, I mean that we're going to go through about one-third of the book of Proverbs. Because I think after reviewing the book of Proverbs, I could spend my whole life preaching on the book of Proverbs and not get done. So I feel like we're going to be going through pretty fast, but we are not going to get very far, maybe chapter 11, and we've already skipped one chapter. Because today we are on chapter three. Now, the first rule of wisdom is that God's word is the foundation of wisdom. God, in all that he has revealed to be in his holy scriptures, is the beginning and foundation. You need to build from there or else you're going to be a fool. To fear God is truly the beginning of wisdom. The second rule, and this is very important because this is also going to be built off of in very many ways, and you need to understand like this message here, you need to understand this very well or else you're going to read Proverbs incorrectly. Because the book of Proverbs is full of all of these things like we just read that are conditional promises. They're if-then statements. If you do this, then this thing will follow. They are conditional promises. Promises built on a condition. Like if I was, if we were parenting Aletheia, a child was very upset that I didn't. So, so uh, if I was parenting Aletheia and I said, if you clean your room, then we are going to go get ice cream. Yay, yeah. <laughs> but then I go, I go to her room and I look and I see like, oh man, oh, it looks fairly clean. But then we go over to the closet. <laughs> and we open up the closet and whoa, like, like, like all this stuff is piled up and I was like, no, this is not cleaning the room. You need to keep the promise, you need, or you need to keep the command to experience the blessing. They keep the command to experience the blessing. The second rule for life, series is at eight rules for life right now. God blesses those who keep his commands. God blesses those who keep his commands. So I hope you have your Bible open to Proverbs chapter three. We're just going to go through the text. We're going to see that there are six, there are six Commands with promises, at least five. The last one's a little different. We'll get to that then. Now, the first one is Proverbs 3, verse 1 to 2. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Now, some modern translations, they translate my son there, my child, which obscures an important point. We didn't talk about it last time, but the author of Proverbs is Solomon. In fact, if you look at ancient literature, there are other like kinds of Proverbs. And it's pretty interesting because uh, there's Egyptian Proverbs and it's always the king writing to his son like this is how you govern justly and you can see that in proverbs like the first reference when he says my son is rehoboam and you think you think solomon didn't always keep his own advice rehoboam not good either we talked about rehoboam last summer but yet, he doesn't say Rehoboam, it says my son. And the reason why is that in the Bible, it's a different worldview. They don't just think like wisdom is for kings. 
They think wisdom is for everyone to take up and read and for every father and parent to teach their children to walk in the way of wisdom. Now the first condition, or the first, uh, the first condition, the first law is obey the father's teaching. And it really is not just like any father's teaching, but the father's teaching according to the word of God in the book of Proverbs. If you follow that teaching, then years of life and peace. If you follow that condition, the promise is long life. And now that should ring a bell in our minds if we've ever read the Ten Commandments. Because in the Ten Commandments, it says... Honor your father and mother that, remember it's the first command with a promise, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father in the Lord, which is everything, human authority is always under God's authority, and you are promised long life. That's number one. Honor your father in the Lord, you will get long life. Number two. Proverbs 3, 3 to 4. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. And so that's like, put them on like a necklace. Write them on the tablet of your heart. If you had a little writing tablet, like on your heart. And you will find, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man, again, this is condition, promise. The condition is you need to put on, so steadfast love, it's different words, so it's, it's like chesed. And this is the word often used to describe God. It is covenant faithfulness in the fact that he is always for his people, even when they're so frustrating and awful all the time. God's faithfulness never ends. But when it's applied to a person, I said, for us to have that, it's for us to be faithful under God to our friends, to our wife, to our obligations. When you put on faithfulness, and then when you, faithfulness in the second word is truth. When you have faithfulness in truth, then you will find favor in the eyes of God and man. Now this is almost like so simple, like, like people who are really faithful people who live up to their promises people like and God likes but that's condition promise so be faithful and people will favor you so that's to be loyal and faithful and God and people will like you three with the command and promise trust in God instead of yourself and you will have an easy life maybe you should say good life so you want a smooth life? You want things to go well for you? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is verse 5 and 6. Lean not on your own understanding, like on your own, you know, trying to figure out things. I was always the guy in life who was always trying to figure out things. Like when I was about 8 years old, I decided I was going to fly. And I got a piece of tin, and I was like, this thing's got a fair amount of lift. And I'm going to jump off this big, like, cliff and just glide through the air. <laughs> My dad said, that's a bad idea. You're going to hurt yourself. No. One of us was right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for a brief half second, did I feel the rush of air slowly met by the hard ground. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And really acknowledge there, it's not like, it's literally know him, which is sort of a, uh, an intimate. In all your ways, be intimate with God. And, so that's a command, do that. And then the, the promise is, he will make straight your paths or level your ground. Conditional promise number four. Follow God's command and not your own ideas and you will get health. Okay. 
getting on dangerous ground here. Be not wise in your own eyes, is verse 7. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh. Literally, it's healing to your belly button. I don't know why they don't translate it like that. Maybe it just sounds goofy. But it's like, and refreshment to your bones. And so like the belly button, which is the most like fleshy part of you, and your bones the most solid. And it's, it's trying to like say, it's your whole body. It's a way of, it's a way of saying that. If you want, oh, now the command here, don't think highly of yourself, fear God, which means to keep God's commands from your heart, turn away from evil, you will get healing and refreshment. All right, promise five. We'll talk about these more later. So if you're wondering like why I'm going so fast, give to God faithfully and you will get wealth. Nine and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. If you want wealth untold, give away your lands and gold. If you desire so much treasure, give to God without measure. And then six. Accept God's discipline and know you are a true son. Verse 11 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Now, there are six conditional statements here. The last one is simply, like, if you are disciplined by the Lord, you can know that he is, he loves you. And we have to talk, like, are Proverbs promises? So I was actually told in, in, in Bible college, it's sort of a shortcut, like, Proverbs aren't promises. But it's not, it's not quite that. We don't want to, we don't want to, like, think about it as, like, well, these things are just, like, not quite promises. Because they're written as promises. And they're promises that are meant to be read in a certain way. We're going to talk about that. Because it would seem to be a little bit too easy. All right? Do the good thing. The good thing will happen. And immediately, it should call to your mind lots of other things in the Bible. And the first one maybe would be the book of Job. The book of Job, it's also in the wisdom literature. It's like almost beside Proverbs with just like Psalms in the middle. And in the book of Job, we have the righteous man, not perfect, but, but a good man, if there ever could be called a good man. But God lets Satan take away all his things, kill his sons. What about Jesus? Now, if there's ever a person whose path should have been level, it was Jesus Christ. For Jesus was actually perfectly righteous. He died young. He did not have excessive wealth. And his path was far from smooth. His health was far from perfect, considering the scourging, crucifixion, and death. What about Peter, Paul, Stephen, Jeremiah? Like, like, you just go through the Bible and it's like, Daniel, like all sorts of suffering people all the time. 1 Corinthians 4.13, when slandered we entreat, we have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuge of all things. Now, how are we to understand the very simple concept? God blesses those who keep his commands in light of all of these other things. And now, the first thing we should probably like see is that we're supposed to read all of it. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that means God's revelation to us, God and all he's been revealed to us is the beginning of wisdom. You're not supposed to just read this thing by itself. It's a little bit like, have you ever been misunderstood when you've been trying to tell someone something? All the time, every day. And what do we do when we're misunderstood? 
We keep talking. Now, sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't, because we're all little flawed. And we need to see the Bible the same way, that the Bible protects itself from being misunderstood by the totality of what it says. And so we don't want to, sometimes people are just like, they pick out this like one verse, this is my life verse right here. And they pretty much ignore everything else in the Bible. The Bible's not supposed to be read like that. We're supposed to read this promise. We're supposed to read the fact of Job and Jesus and Jeremiah and all these righteous people. We're supposed to read these things together, understanding wisdom in the synthesis of these facts, not the particulars. So, two big things when reading these promises. Number one is we need to have an eternal perspective on God's promises. Well, think about Jesus' teaching in the Beatitudes especially. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. It doesn't say, like, Jesus is like, oh, you're persecuted, like something's got to be out of whack here because you're not getting the blessing of God. He says, no, you've got to think of an eternal perspective here. And the fact is that these few short moments of persecution are nothing compared to the reward ahead. So we think of God's promises, we think about them in the long term. For truly... This slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we trust in the Lord with all our heart and we receive the promise, not just thinking of the promise for the next 10 minutes, but the promise forever. We can't look on these rewards as mere rewards for today. We need to see heavenly treasure as truly better. Because that's that's how Jesus taught. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves break, where thieves do not break in and steal. And it's like there is something like a little missing. Even if you have all of the wealth in the world, you know. You know, what's that going to be on the last day of your life? It's not a cheapening of the promise to look at the eternal. It reveals the fullness of the promise. It only cheapens it if you don't really believe in eternal life. And if you don't believe in eternal life, like, I'm glad you're here. Let's keep talking. (laughs) Because if you don't look to the eternal treasures, you're not going to make the right decisions in life right now. We need to look at the whole thing. And so when we look at these promises, we want to see the promises in light of the whole game. It's like if I, if I promised you, who are the Rough Riders playing next? Somebody. Okay, let's go back in time. Let's imagine the Rough Riders are going to go play the Edmonton Esca Elks. And I told you, I guarantee you, they are going to win this game. I know I may sound like a little bit of a fool, but I guarantee you they are going to win this game. It is a promise. Now, don't put money on it. I don't condone, don't want sports gambling. But I promise you they are going to win. Now, if the game started in typical rider fashion and the quarterback, whoever it is this week, like drops back to pass, I literally like Googled, like, who is the quarterback? And they're like, yeah, we don't know. Um, The quarterback dropped back to pass, and there's a little bit of pressure. He throws up a pass, and as it flies through the air, it's a bit of a lame duck. And all of a sudden, one of the Edmonton players snatches the ball for an interception and runs back the right way. Hopefully, they're smart enough to do that. Runs back the right way for a touchdown. And then you turn to me. It was like... I thought, you promised. You promised that the Rough Riders were going to win. Now, that's silly. I didn't promise the Rough Riders were going to not be down like normal. (laughs) 
I promised that they were going to win at the end of the game. Now, in the same way, when we look at these rewards that God promises, we don't think, okay, this is the thing I'm going to get in five minutes from now or in five years from now, which is literally like five minutes in light of eternity. I'm like, no, God is going to fulfill all of these promises when you think of the totality, the totality of our lives considering the eternal. There's so many times in life where we are like so quick to rush to, we're so quick to, to get impatient. Like, I've, I've met people numerous times and they come to me, it's like, like pastor, like I'm just trying this Christian life, it's just not working. Like everything is harder now. Like my wife isn't getting along with me because we're trying to go to church. My, my, my kids don't know what I'm doing. And it's like, and, and, and I have to tell them, it's like, first of all, like, you know, I know that God would promise to you like the smooth life if you turn to him. But first of all, A, you probably like really need to fully turn to him because usually when people first, like they don't know how far they have to go yet. But secondly, it's like you've got to look at the long term. Don't look at the five minutes. Look at the forever when you see God's promises, knowing that it will be fuller and better than you could ever imagine here. Now, secondly, you know, I don't think we want to just totally, like, look to the future here. Like, these promises are not too heavenly-minded to be any earthly good. Because we can look to the exceptions, like Jesus didn't have a long life. But exceptions don't disprove rules if you understand the rules, how they're supposed to be understood. Well, I can tell you very truly that all humans have, I can say, humans have two legs. That's a true saying. Or maybe more accurately for our church. Humans have two arms. Now that doesn't mean that Andrew is an alien. <laughs> the fact that human beings have two arms does not say there's no exceptions to this. But this is, this is the truth as we look at it. In the same way, when we read these promises, we can read them and trust them boldly. Understanding that variations exist in God's plan. But the central truth of these promises is for us as we follow them. It's just like I can say the truth. The sky is blue. Everyone agrees the sky is blue? Well, sometimes it's night and it's black. Sometimes it's red. It's often very smoky from a wildfire. But yet the sky remains blue. And in the same way, we can say these promises are true. Even though outliers in our life exist, if you live in them, you will feel God's promises and his blessing in your life. And so what shall we do? For all of these six things, and when we read all of Proverbs are like this, which is why I'm spending a lot of time on it, is to say that we can bank on these promises we can enjoy the benefits of walking in the Lord's grace by faith in Jesus Christ. Working in us by the Holy Spirit, like we're not earning any of this because we can only do them by faith, by the power that God gives to us as we receive Jesus Christ. And we do them to live out God's holy commands in such a way that we can please the Father, knowing that he blesses those who keep his commands. And so what shall we do? Let's walk in them. First, if we follow our Father's teaching of God's commands, we will have long life. Now, this is logical in some way. You know, follow your parents' commands in the Lord. You're going to avoid reckless drinking. Avoid a lot of the dumb stuff that I did had I listened to my dad a little more. But when you walk in God's way, God will be with you in everything that you have to do. And the Bible fares this out. Like it is truly said, like we are immortal in God's plan until the day we die. 
We are immortal in God's plan. You see Paul, like Paul, like all of the ways that he could have died, shipwrecked, get onto the island, goes to warm himself by the fire, and bam, he gets bit by a viper. That's always the point in the story. I'm just like, really? Like that? <laughs> but he knows. He knows God's plan. God's revealed. He's got to stand before Caesar. Like he can't die from this snake. He shakes it off into the fire and keeps going. When we walk in God's blessing, we have nothing to fear fear from the frightening things in life. Do not forget my teaching. Let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. God blesses those who walk in his commands. If you are faithful, merciful, loving, and true, God and people will favor you. If you want people to be your friend, be a good friend. Be trustworthy to all those around you. And God promises that he will bless you and that people will enjoy you. You will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. God blesses those who keep his commandments. Trust in God instead of yourself and you will have the good life. Yeah, I use Paul as an example. He didn't exactly have an easy life. But Philippians 4, 12, 13, I've learned the secret of placing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The ways of the wicked are truly hard. You don't have to look very far to see that. But if you want a good life, trust in God's way and not your own plans. And... You can look to eternal life to boot. Follow, for, follow God's commands and not your own ideas, and you will get wealth. Or not wealth, I said health. Wealth is next. Proverbs 3, 7, 8. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Now, I stand on a little bit of, like, controversial ground here. But if you spend any time and acquainted with any older Christian writer, like, they, they will take it as just sort of a matter of fact. The first thing that you should do if you fall ill is to consider your relationship with God. Now, we know Paul is given a thorn in his flesh. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus suffered and never, never sinned. But it doesn't take away from the fact that every hardship is a good time to check ourselves. And think, am I turning away from evil? Am I fearing the Lord? Is God sending me this to turn me back to him? If you want healing, fear God and turn away from evil. Don't think too highly of yourself and you may be healed today. And for sure, for sure, you will be whole and healthy for eternity. Five, give to God faithfully and you will get wealth. Now, I would just challenge you, like ask anyone here who has stepped out in faith and given faithfully and sacrificially to God. They have been blessed, and by the way, eternal life, eternal rewards forever. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And then six, and six is an important one. Accept God's discipline and know you are a true son. Now it ends with this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. It's funny because it's all this like condition, follow God, get the blessing. Follow God, get the blessing. Five times it does that for peace, prosperity, and health. And then he ends with don't despise the Lord's discipline. Now... This gives us a guardrail in our theology, an important guardrail. So on the one side, or imagine uh, if you're playing bowling with like five-year-olds and they have like the bumpers on, 
the best kind of bowling. Because no matter what, you're going to be hitting one of those things, unless you're really unlucky. Because boom, boom. And so on the one side, we need to see the yes. We are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ alone. The only way that we can stand, the only way that we can walk in holiness is by the precious gift of Jesus Christ our Lord. That we are saved and have our eternal home in heaven by God's gift alone in Jesus Christ. And there is nothing we can do to earn it at all. And yet, as we walk in that grace, empowered by the Holy Spirit, when we step out in faithfulness to follow his commands, God will bless us in that. So that's the one bumper on the one side. And now the other bumper is that we could take that and we could think, oh man, when bad things happen to me, it means God's angry with me. When my crops, when I don't get rain for my crops, when I get healthy, or when I, when I get cancer, like something is really wrong with me, and I am unloved. But it's almost, it's, no, 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 that's not what it means. For those whom God has taken to be his own, those who are his children, that even our hardships, when we own his own, even our hardships are not proof that God is against us. Now, it might be something wrong with our life and we need to turn, and that's, 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 that's a good thing. That's what discipline is for. But even our hardships are proof that God loves us and is putting this in our life as bitter medicine to make us whole, not just for this current life, but whole for eternity. Like my own father, you know, as the oldest son of a Dutch dairy farmer, there were high expectations on me and a red backside when I didn't live up to them. But truly, my dad loved me, loves me. And if you think that I'm like a decent pastor, like some of the credit, like under God and Christ, goes to, goes to my dad who was willing to be hard on me because he loved me. Indulgent parents make weak men. And so we see that God is only hard on us for our good. And to drive us back into the circle of blessing, where we step out in obedience to his commands, empowered by God's spirit, to receive what is good now, and looking forward to see what is best forever. So I just want to challenge you now, we just had like these, these five things, like walk in obedience, say, oh Lord God, Move my heart, empower me to be able to live faithfully, to give faithfully, to follow your commands faithfully so I can stand in your blessing. And even though when hardship comes, and it will, that it comes not from an angry God, but from a loving God who is working towards your best in all things. Today and forever.